Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today. Happy Veterans Day for all of us, especially for those of us who served. Thank you so much for your service, and may the Lord continue to bless you in all that you do today. Um, it's been a long week. My wife has been sick pretty much the entire week. I've been taking care of the chores around the house, and so for some reason, I'm feeling kind of exhausted today. So, something that I, something that I thought can't happen to me, but I, I am feeling kind of exhausted and fatigued today. So I do ask you to pray for me too. Uh, but I'm thankful that my wife is able to be here. Show is able to be here with us this morning to worship with us. Uh, yesterday we, because she was. Uh, she was sick. We spent all day yesterday just watching movies, but I'm glad she's able to join us today. So praise God for that. Uh, we do also have some food in the um, social hall. So after church, if you would like to grab some food, feel free to do that. And at this time, I would like to invite anybody else who has any other announcements to make them. Trustees meeting after church today. Sue Fredrickson called me this morning. She was having some trouble with her legs and she didn't think she was going to get here and it looks like she didn't. Um, she has a new telephone number for the, for the prayer chain and um, it was put in, I guess, the feather wrong and um, she wants people to know what the number is. I have it here. I'll tell it to you now, but if you check with me afterwards, you can write it down. 530-854- Three five nine nine. She said, "This is for the prayer chain, and uh, leave a short message or text if you want to, or um, or e or I guess you could email her also, um, and uh, you can tell her whether you want it put on the email or whether you want it on the telephone chain, whatever." What? Five three zero. Eight five four three five nine nine. Oh, and um, some people have been calling Rod, and he's not doing it anymore. Sue Fredrickson is doing it, so this is the number. Thank you, Joni. So we're selling tickets on the Christmas baskets, and um, we're raising money for the float and the Parade of Lights, which is on December 14th. So please support us with this. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, starting next Sunday, there will be a box in the foyer for our Christmas gift for the staff, and thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Just one more announcement since Joe got up and I made an announcement there. I just re remembered uh, we, will be uh, we will be nominating Joe's name to the conference committee on Hmong ministry over at the conference. And so it will be up to them whether or not they're going to accept the nomination. But just to let everybody know that, I, you know, Joe has been involved a lot with the Hmong ministry here at our church. He's always here for worship with them whenever they, uh, whatever events that they have whatever programs that they have, he's always been here with them. And so as part of that, seeing his uh, passion for the Hmong ministry, uh, we have decided to nominate his name to be part of the conference committee on Hmong ministry starting in 2020. So just letting us, everybody know that. Hopefully we'll, we'll see what the conference say. Okay, so just let everybody know. So everybody give Joe, Joe a hand for that. Okay, any other, other announcement this time? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, no more announcements at this time. It's time for us to greet each other for the passing of the peace.
If you're able to stand, please stand with me at this time and join me for the call to worship that is in your bulletin. The call to worship. As the rains pour from heaven, soaking the earth that it may produce good things. We have been blessed with so many gifts and talents. Come, let us worship and celebrate the might, mighty love and power of God. Oh, Amen. Please turn your hymnals to page 79. Page 79, Holy God, we praise thy name. Father, once again, what an honor it is to come before you to worship you today in your house. Today, Father, as we come in your presence, we remember all those who have served this wonderful and great nation. We ask for your blessings to continue to be upon their lives and continue to hold them close to you at all times. We ask for your grace to continue to shine upon them. Not only that, Father, as we worship you today, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us and to empower us with voices and with hearts to praise you today. And also give us ears that we may hear your message and may our lives be transformed to be more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And so on this day, we pray and lift all things up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You all may be seated at this time. It's time for the choir anthem.
Our first reading this morning is Psalms 50, 9 through 12. I have no need of the bull from your stall or the goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. The words of God for the people of God. And at this time, as a tribute to all of our, the veterans in our church, we'll be playing a video. Let's give a hand to all of them. May the Lord bless all of you and your family for many generations to come, for your service, your bravery, your courage, for your service for this wonderful, wonderful nation. May the Lord be with all of you. At this time, it's time for us to share our joys and our concerns. Um, I'd like prayers for my husband, Dan. Uh, <clears throat> Tuesday, he's going to have a uh, cardiac cath catheterization. So hoping that um, that goes well. They find a blockage there or something that will fix his breathing issues. Thank you. Prayers for Dan. Uh, it's just nice to be back in church after several <laughs> bouts in the hospital. Uh, I wanted to say I have a Facebook picture that uh, uh, someone uh, 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 took off the Facebook of the Callaway family, and I was uh, Jolene in the 70s, the early 70s, because uh, Lynn said they had married uh, Lynn and Steve. So, but I have a picture here of their. It's I think um, the. Uh, Ardith was uh, is in her 90s, and but I'll have Micah put it up on the board, so that, that those people that remember them, and uh, there are a few of us here, so but that they can see it. Thank you so much, Ellen. Yeah. Yes. 
Susan? Okay. Prayers for Susan. And for Junior, he wasn't on the board, but he served in 44 to 46 in the Navy. For Junior? Okay, my husband Dan wasn't up there either, and he was in uh, the Navy from uh, 60, 60 to 64. Thank you so much for their services. Anyone else? Okay. It's time for us to pray together. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you so much for always keeping us close to you. We thank you so much for all those who served in this country. We thank you so much for their courage, their bravery. We ask, Father, that you continue to bless them and their families on this day. Continue to be with them, all the things that they have sacrificed, the things that they have given up for the sake of this nation, which is a true, true blessing from you. And so, Father, we thank you so much for them. And at this time, as we also come before you, we also lift up Dan to you for the procedures that he will, and the tests that he will be having here in the, in the next couple of days here, along with Susan. We lift both of them up to you, Father. We ask that you be with them, that these testings will go as according to your will, and that we will find nothing but good news from these things, Father. Father, we ask for your strength to be upon both of them and also their families. We also ask for strength to be among our churches, for every member here at our church, Father, as we go on this journey, as we go on this journey together with them, Father. We pray for the courage to be able to just reach out to them and encourage them through these times, Father. Not only that, we also thank you so much for Helen being back here with us again, once again, to worship together with us. We are not the same without her. Her presence, as well as everybody's presence, is always needed as we are one family. We're all brothers and sisters through your son, Jesus Christ. And whenever one is not here, Father, we are always in need of that person. And so we're so thankful for her to be with us here today. Father, I also pray for my wife, Shoa, who's been sick these last few days. I ask that you be with her. We're so thankful that she's getting better and better again. Father, I also pray for myself as I stand before you to serve you on this day, that you be with me, provide me the strength that is necessary to be able to serve you as according to your ways and as according to your will, to be able to shepherd the flock in which you have put before me, Father. Father, you are the true wisdom, and all wisdom begins in you, and so I come to you to ask for that wisdom and also for that strength to be able to stand before your people today, Father. Father, not only that, we also pray for our community, we pray for our church, we pray for all those who are around us, those who are in need of your grace, those who are in need of your love. We ask that you shine upon each and every single one of them, Father, and those, whatever they need, that you provide for them. We also pray for our nation, all the leaders of our nation. We pray that we will continue to be a country, continue to be a nation that will fear you and will always look to you as the guiding light, as the one to lead us as we move forward throughout our lives, Father. We also pray for this earth, all the people of this earth, for all your children of this earth, that you continue to keep us close to you at all times. And so, Father, together we pray the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand with me if you're able to.
Turn your hymnals to page 451. Page 451, may the Lord be our vision. You may be seated. Our second reading today is from Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacharias. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacharias, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zachary stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. The words of God for the people of God. Money and wealth. Money and wealth. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now what does money mean to us? You know, when we think about it, it is not so much that money is important to us, but it is, so, it is about what money represents. It's about what it symbolizes to us in our lives that determines how we often approach this topic of money and wealth. Oftentimes, what money represents to us is security. It often represents to us power. It often represents to us social status. Many times the way we de define success in our lives is by how much money we have in the bank. 
It is often time is time for us a time for blessing, it's time for prosperity. And so having money has become so much a part of our identity as a people. Very much like our community and other areas. But should we serve money? What is it that's most important? Is this is it money that's important to us? Or what is what is the national, what is the one that helps us understand this topic of money and wealth? Out of uh, around forty parables in which Jesus Christ spoke and he used in the New Testament, a third of them was about this topic of money and wealth. If we were to do a little research on the Bible, one thing we will see is that the Bible often talks about faith. It often talks about prayer. But it dedicates itself to about 500 verses when it talks about prayer. It dedicates itself to about 500 verses when it talks about faith. But when it comes down to talk about money, when it talks about money, there's over 2,000 Bible verses that talks about money. Why is that? Why is it so important to God to talk about money? There's a gentleman here, there's a long gentleman here in our town here in Orville. He was upset by the Orville CMA church. Every single day he makes a video on Facebook talking about the church here in Orville. It talks about how pastors are, are, are deceivers and pastors are just trying to go around asking for, uh, asking for tithe because they, they can't find any other job so they need to work as pastors, right? It talks about how much God needs his money and things of that sort. It talks about how much you know, the church always talks about money and money and things like that. And, he, he, and that's, that, I mean, that's the whole issue that he had with them was over money. And that oftentimes become the issue in the church. Oftentimes money, you know, when we have divisions, when we have um, disagreements in the church, when we, when we have issues in the church, a lot of times it has to do with money. Church is often split up because of this topic of money. Because we put this idea, we put this, this, this value so much into money that it controls us. It controls our lives. And so everything that we do, we do, is based upon money. Oftentimes, the things that we do is based upon money. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew about the society that he was growing up, and he knew about the society that he was living in. He knew about how money affected the society that he was living in. And even, even though he came and even though he talked a lot about money, actually Jesus Christ was the one that spoke more about money than anybody else in the scripture. And he spoke a lot about that, but his point was not so much about money. But his point was about our relationship with God. And how money, how money and wealth plays a role in that. And so in order for us to really, really understand Jesus Christ's view of money and wealth, we need, we need to reestablish our identity. We need to reestablish our identity and not find, not find our identity in this topic of money, not find money to be the source of security, not to find money to be the source of power or social status or success. Or wealth. But instead, instead of seeing things from the, the view of just having money, one thing we need to do, we need to realize that we are here to serve God. And we are here to reestablish that identity. To find that identity once again in God. And it is through that that we will understand the role of money in our lives. In our society and our culture through the eyes of God. 
Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says this. It says that it is in Christ that you have been brought to fullness. You see, it is only in Christ that we will understand the fullness of life. It is only in Christ that we will understand the fullness of all things that we face, including, including the topic of money and wealth. And it is in Christ that our identity is no longer about being rich or being poor when it comes to money. It is in Christ that our identity is not lo no longer about being Jewish or being Greek, being Hmong or being Anglo. It is in Christ that money no longer controls the way that we think, the way that we behave, the way that we use money. You see, in Eastern culture, I've talked about this before, we hate the poor. We don't like to help the poor. And the reason for that is because we believe in karma. We believe in karma. We believe that people are poor because of karma. Because of their past life, they've done something so wrong, so evil, that that is the reason why in this lifetime they are poor. And so we have no sense of charity. We have no sense of trying to help those who are less fortunate than us. I've told us before that my father is an orphan. He has no memory of his parents. He has no memory of his parents. So he grew up. He grew up with his older brother and his older brothers and their wives were the ones who raised him. So he has, he has no memory at all of who his parents were. And so he, he, he always tells the stories of how it was to suffer in Laos as a young boy, being an orphan, not having anything to eat, not having anything to wear, because there was no social services at the, in Laos. There's no charity in Laos. There's nothing in Laos. You can't take care of yourself, that's it. And so he depended for most of his life, he depended on his brothers and uh, their wives to be able to take care of them. And of course, they were all very, very poor. They had their own kids too. And so they, they have to take care of their kids too. And so in, many, in, in some of these cultures, when we think about the poor, we think that they are just living out their karma. We think that they are being punished for the things that they've done in the past. And so there's no incentive for us to really help them out. It's really difficult. It's really difficult to talk about charity. You know, for long as we've been Christians for the last 50 years or since, you know, 50 70 years, to 70 years or so. But, you know, what to change that mentality to, to go towards this idea of being charitable is something that is difficult because we don't have anything in our background to really help us understand that. And so it's all about karma. And yet here in the West, we often have this view in which we take it to an extreme also, in which we don't really like those people who are extremely wealthy. We often see them as, as cheaters. We often see them as, as con men or whatever. And so in different cultures, we often take things to different extremes in the things that we do. But the whole point of Jesus Christ, when he was talking about money, he was not talking about money itself. But what he was talking about was he was talking about relationships. He was talking about how we can build wealth through developing relationships. And one of those ways in which we develop relationships is in the way in which we use our money. It is to be used to help others. And we know in the story of the young rich ruler, ruler he was able to gather all this money for himself. He was a very, very wealthy man. And yet he went to Jesus Christ and he says, how am I going to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus Christ said to him, you have to sell all 
these things. You have to sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And the scripture tells us that he went away sad because he couldn't do that. Because for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was not condemning him for being rich or being wealthy or having a lot of money because we see in the Old Testament, we see that many of the prophets were very wealthy people. We see that many of the kings, King David, King Solomon, they were all very wealthy people. But the thing that Jesus Christ was talking about is that this man, he spent his whole life gathering all these things for himself, but he did nothing for anybody else. He was not willing to do anything to help anybody else. And, when, and so when Jesus Christ is talking about money, this is what he's talking about, is what are we able to do with the things that we're able to? to have, the things in which God has gathered for us, the things that God has blessed us with. What are we able to do with these things? We look at the story of Zacchaeus and we see, we see that Zacchaeus was a man who was very, very wealthy also. He was a tax collector. And those guys back in those days were very, very corrupted. They would collect a little bit for the, the government and they would take everything else and they would keep that to themselves. And that's why when Jesus went with Zacchaeus to, to, to his house, the people were, were, were saying that, you know, why is Jesus Christ, why is he going to a sinner's house? Because he was very, very corrupted. He was a very corrupted man. But when Jesus was at his house, this is what he says. He says, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And so upon hearing that Jesus Christ proclaimed, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. So you see the whole point was that money ruined his, the relationship within that community. Money corrupted the whole society in which Zac Zacchaeus was in. And so Jesus Christ was teaching him, Zacchaeus, and all these other people at that time, that we need to restore these relationships. We need to restore these, uh, this society, this culture that we are in. And in order for us to do that, we need to understand what we need to do with all these things that we've been able to gather for ourselves. And so the whole point of wealth, the whole point of using money, is to help the community. It was to help the community. It was to build each other up. Not so much about just gathering for ourselves, but about what we can do with the things that we gather to help each other out. And so the whole thing that Jesus Christ was really talking about is about relationships. It was about relationship. That wealth is not based upon how much money you're able to gather for yourself. But wealth is based upon the relationships that you're able to build in your life. It is based upon how many people you're able to help in your life. And this is the whole point that Jesus Christ was trying to share with them. And oftentimes we take it to certain extremes. We started hating other people. We started, we started having all these social you know, class warfare and things of that sort. But that was never Jesus Christ's, that was never his idea. His idea was how can we use this money? How can we use all these things? How can we build relationship with the things that we do? And God wants us to do this out of faith. Not out of obligation or not, some, not because you, you've been obligated to do something. Not, not, not simply out of duty or anything of that sort. But he wants you to do it out of faith. And we see in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4, we see that the difference between Abel and Cain was that Abel came to God and he gave out of faith. And Abel came, uh, came, came before God, but Cain didn't, Cain didn't give it out of faith. He did it because he felt obligated to do it. He did it because he felt coerced to do it. And that's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the, the scripture teaches us that, it, that each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Because God loves a cheerful giver. And this is what God is looking for. 
God is looking for cheerful givers, people whose life has been so transformed that they are willing to help other people. They actually find, they find, they find fulfillment in helping people. That they're not just simply doing these things out of obligation or because they feel that it is their legal duty to do something, but that out of their own heart, that they're willing, they're willing to help people genuinely. And this is what money and this is what wealth, this is what wealth is all about when Jesus Christ talks about it. And so oftentimes when he talks about us using money, he's teaching us that we need to help each other. That God has blessed us so much that we need to help other people. We need to build, use this money as a way to build relationships among, among our, our people, among each other, among our community, among our church. These things are not things that are, are going to divide us because like I said earlier, so many times we're divided because of money. In the church we fight because of money. In our society, we fight because one person is more, you know, more successful. One person has more money than the other person. And we fight over these things. But God is saying, no. I bless you with these things so that you can love one another. So that you can use it as a way, as a way to help and build each other up. And by using these things, it, is, it reveals to God that we trust in him. We trust in his promises. We trust in the things that he has asked us to do. And by giving, by giving, we become more and more like God. It is not that God needs something from us. The very first Bible verse that we read up there, that Jim read up there from Psalms chapter 50, verse 9 through verse 11, God says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects and the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not even tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. And so many times we come to church with the idea that, you know what, why does the church need so much from us? Why does God need so much from us? You know, God, he's, he's supposed to be the creator. He's supposed to be the one who owns everything. Why does he want so much from, from us? The reality is, the reality is that when we talk about money, it's not about what God wants from us, but it's about God transforming us. It's about him transforming us and teaching us how to help each other, how to build each other up how to build relationships within our community, how to build relationships in our churches. And this is the whole point. That's the whole point when he talks about wealth. Wealth is not about how much you're able to gather for yourselves, but wealth is about how much you're able to help other people. Now, why, that's why the scripture tells us it is better to give than it is to receive. And so today... I'm going to talk a little bit about our church. We do have many things in which we are going to do here in the future, here in the year 2020. And many of those, those things that we do is going to depend on your financial giving to the church. And just like the scripture says, God does not want people who are giving, you know, under compulsion or anything of that sort, but God wants us to be cheerful givers to him. And so I want us to be cheerful givers and give to God as according to what God has opened up our hearts to do. And the scriptures that the, the guide for us is tithing or 10% of our income. We see that in the story of Abraham. We see that in the life of Jacob. We see that in the law of Moses. We see that in the, in the nation of Israel, which they often use tithing or that 10% as a guideline for them to really build their, their society, to really build the relationships within their culture. It is something that is good also for us to use, to think about that 10%, to think about that tithing as a way for us to start giving to God. And not only are we to give the leftovers, but the things that we must remember is that just like Abel, we are to give the first fruits to God. Above all things, we're to give to God first and everything else be after that, we can use. 
Many times we are like Cain. We go and the scripture tells us that Cain gives the fruit of the soil to God only. Picks up all these things that's left over. And he gives to God. Many times we often do that in our lives. Many times as Christians we, often, we do that too much. We, we, we spend everything on ourselves and whatever's left over, we give that to God. But what God desires from us is the first fruits. Because where our money is, where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And that's what God is looking at. And so we have so many things to do in our church this coming year. Discipleship for our youth group. We have our youth group, they come here, you know, once or twice every Friday night to meet. That's not enough for them. We need more. We need to be able to help them more. We have many things that we can do around here in our church, you know, you know that, that can encourage the youth to come here more. Maybe fix up the basketball courts. Maybe provide them a place to play sport or something of that sort. Things for us to really need to think about to involve the youth more into our church. Many times we said the youth is the future of our church, and in a sense that is true. But we also need to realize that the church, uh, that the youth, is the, is, they are the presence of our church. They are here right now. We need to take care of them now. We don't wait until the future to take care of the youth. They're, they are here with us. And so we must do something to encourage them, to bring them to church. Make them excited about the church. We have our children we have our children, too. We're, we're planning with, with Tracy, who's in, who's in charge of our children's ministry, about doing VBS programs for our church, or for our kids this coming year. That's something she wants to do. Something that, that will be good for, you, uh, for our, our kids. How can we get our kids excited to come to church? You know, just this past week, Eli told me, Dad, I'm so excited to go to church. I wish I could go to church every single day. You know? He said, you know, Dad, why can't we just go to school one day a week and why can't we go to ch uh, church five days a week? So he's, all, he's excited to come to church. I want all of our kids to be excited to come to church. They need that excitement. We need to build that in them right now. We need discipleship for our men's and our women's group. I know we, we, we really have the circle group. That's a great thing. We need to keep that going. But we also need small groups for our men. How about our younger women that are not able to meet with the circle group? We need to be able to provide them something too. Something that maybe they might find interest in. The younger women and our men. What can we do? I know uh, Calm, Dr. Calm already talked to me about wanting to start a small group with the men and start, start off by just doing some little social programs and then studying the book of the Gospel of John together. But in order for him to do that, he's going to need support. He's going to need support. So that's something that we can look into. We got our praise and worship. We need to look at our praise and worship again. And we need to look at many things, many things in our church. Many things in our church that we need to get done. And that requires, that requires all of us to help support the church. And so for this coming year, I pray, I pray that you will continue to support our church as we continue to make disciples for Jesus Christ. That's one thing that's also very important. We often talk about making disciples for Jesus Christ, but we have yet to define what that means in the context of our local church. That's something we need to start thinking about, is how, what does that mean in the context of our local church? Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for your blessing. We thank you so much for the privilege to be with us. We thank you for the lessons that she has done in this Christ Father. Now, Lord, it's not about how much we can gather for ourselves, but Lord, it's about how much we're able to help each other. Lord, it's about the relationships that we have with each other, Father. And so we ask that you put that message in our heart so we will always remember that. Father, this coming year in 2020, as we proceed to move forward to serve you, to do the ministry of your kingdom. We ask that you be with us and continue to use us and empower us for the sake of your kingdom, we pray. Amen. It's time for us to do offertory.
Father, we bow our heads before you. We bring these tithes and these offerings for you. For the sake of your kingdom, we ask that you use it to multiply your kingdom, to proclaim your gospel throughout all nations, Father, until the day in which your son Jesus Christ returns. We ask that you continue to bless our church and empower us for your ministry. And so we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing. Turn your hymnals to page 576. Page 576, Rise Up, O Men of God. You may be seated. May the grace of God be with all of you until we meet again. God bless.